So everybody hear me and can everybody see the uh, beautiful blue Kaplan slide? I've just been asked to uh, remind you if you could please just uh, put any questions, comments that you have in the chat panel rather than the question and answer panel. That would be lovely. And uh, okay, I think we are ready to go. So, hello, good afternoon. Um, I hope it's a little bit sunnier where you are than where I am at the moment. Uh, I'm currently got a lovely view of Dundon Shard, but it is absolutely chucking it down. So uh, I hope it's a little bit better where you are. So, welcome to this IAS Made Easy Masterclass. Mine is Sally Baker. This afternoon, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour uh, of some of the key accounting standards that you will be coming across in your studies for your professional exams. So, if you get too heavily into the accounting standards, just a little bit about me. I'm afraid we don't have a uh, exam this afternoon, so instead, Oh, and that's not worked either. Uh, you have got this picture of me, um, which is, to be honest, probably preferable than seeing me in the flesh because I'm actually having a bit of a bad hair day today, so uh, the picture's a better option. Um, you can uh, um, see me there. Um, I've been a tutor with Kaplan now for, hmm, I'm guessing on for 14 years, specialising in all things financial reporting related, like my debits and credits. Uh, you can also see there the front cover of my book, which is the very wonderful, of course, Student's Guide to Preparing Financial Statements, um, a book that takes you through lots of accounting standards and shows you how to apply them when preparing financial statements. So um, for anybody that has just joined us uh, in the last minute or so, I'm going to remind you again to please put any questions that you've got in the channel. I have a lovely assistant, Jim manning the chat panel today uh, if you want to say hello Jim and uh, he will be able to answer any questions that you might have okay so if we start uh, thinking of the um, accounting standards that we are going to cover over our next hour or so together is the list of what I'm hoping to get through, okay? So we have uh, IS2, Infantry, IS16, PPE, some of the really key important accounting standards that you will come through, uh, regardless of whether you're studying at the lower level of your qualification or whether you're reaching the higher final levels. These are all important accounting standards. Um, I am hoping to get through uh, um, all of them today. Um, we will just have to see a little bit how the timing goes. Uh, if there are any that I don't leave until the end, uh, it'll be IS18 and IS37 that will be last. Uh, there will be a recording of this presentation being sent out to you afterwards, uh, together with a copy of these slides. So um, if for any reason we don't manage to get through all of them, you will be able to see the content of the slides, even if you don't manage to be able to take them take you through them. So let's get started with uh, IAS2, Infantry. It's always the first accounting standard that we learn about, as well as being the first in terms of the uh, numerical sequence as well. Now, although it's been modified slightly over the years, um, IAS2 actually first originated in 1975, believe it or not, so uh, nearly 40 years old. So we'll have to have a, a big birthday party, I think, for it next year. Probably older than a lot of you listening. Anyway, so, infantry. Uh, the definition of infantry. Infantry are assets that are held for resale in the normal course of business. They are therefore the goods that we are in business to buy and sell. Uh, in terms of how we record infantry, how we recognize infantry in the financial statements, it is an asset in the balance sheet. It is a current asset, so we debit infantry in the balance sheet. We are then crediting costs of sales. So when we buy goods originally, goods are debited to purchases as an expense when we buy them. But by definition, if they are in infantry at the year end, 
we've not actually sold them at the year end. So we therefore have to take them back out of cost of sales because they haven't been sold in the year. So show it as an asset and then we are crediting cost of sales. Now, the main point in IAS2, how we then measure infantry. So infantry is measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. The cost of infantry is uh, defined as being the cost of purchase and conversion to bring the infantry to their present location and condition. So that means that we would include the basic cost of the item, but we'd also be able to include any import duties and delivery costs as it is part of getting the items to their present location within our warehouse. So a manufacturing, manufacturing business and uh, production costs would also be taken into consideration because these are the costs of getting the infantry to their present condition. Okay, so basic costs plus any delivery costs and if you are manufacturing also production costs. We can include all of those costs. So try to remember the phrase present location and condition. Uh, costs that would be excluded from this uh, cost figure would be any abnormal or wasted production costs um, and also storage costs once you've actually uh, got the goods to their current condition. We're going to make the lower of cost and net realizable value. Net realizable value is then the same price of the goods, less completion costs and costs to make the sale. So uh, whatever you believe that you'll be able to sell the item for, again, if we're manufacturing, completion costs will just simply be the cost of finishing that production process. Uh, cost to make the sale, well, that might include packaging costs. Uh, we are paying commission maybe to a salesperson then we would take that away as well. So net realizable value is the net amount that the business is going to make from selling the item. Okay. It is also just worth noting we measure infantry on an item by item basis. So if we do have two uh, different trucks, then uh, we would look at the lower of cost at realizable value on those products individually rather than looking at the cost of the two of them together and the net realizable value of the two of them together and then simply taking the lower. So we would measure them on an item by item basis. We record infantry by debiting infantry credit cost of sales and we do that double entry with the lower of the cost and the net realizable value of the infantry. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of why, as with things in life, if we can understand the logic behind why we're doing something, then we tend to find it a little bit easier to remember. So the whole reason behind why we're doing this on infantry is because as accountants, we don't like assets being overstated. We like to prudent as accountants. We like to be a little bit cautious when we're uncertain about things. So what we're saying with this rule is that if we think that when we come to sell the goods that we're going to make a loss, they are being prudent and we recognize that loss straight away. If the net realizable value is lower than the cost, we're thinking that we're going to be making a loss when we sell the item. I'm writing it down to net realizable value now, before we sell it, we are recognizing that loss, we are anticipating that loss. In a situation where the net realizable value is higher than the cost, in other words, we're thinking that we're going to make a profit when we come to sell the item, they are not recognizing that profit at the moment. We would measure the item at its cost and we would not be recognizing that profit. So we don't recognize profit until it actually happens. Okay? So overall, it is uh, an application of the concept of prudence. Okay? So that's our first accounting standard. I'm just going to uh, we have a check on the chat panel, just make sure everybody is happy. happy. Any questions? No good. Okay. I think we're okay. So I shall move on to our next accounting 
standard. So the next accounting standard is the slightly chunkier topic of IAS 16, property, plant and equipment. Now, whether you are starting out your accounting career at the moment or whether you're studying final level papers, um, this particular accounting standard gets tested at all various levels, so it's really important to get a grasp with the basics on this one. So again, let's start with the definition. Plant and equipment, these are defined as being tangible items. In other words, I can physically touch them. Okay, are Items that are held for use in the business and they're expected to be used for more than one accounting period. So examples would be um, our office property, so our offices, our factories, machinery within the factories, delivery vehicles, computer equipment, furniture, etc. Okay, that all come under the guidance of IAS 16. So if we just think about the definition of infantry, which was items that are held for resale, and then the definition of PPE, items that are held for use, then you know why you've got something, then that's going to determine how we account for it. When an item is held for resale, we apply IAS 2 to it. How, when it's held for use in the business, then we would think about applying IAS 16. Now, accounting for PPE is going to be more complicated than accounting for infantry, simply because PPE uh, go through various stages during its lifetime, and we have therefore got to think about all of these various stages. So, this is our initial recognition, essentially buying the asset and how we deal with things at that point. We have several things that might happen whilst we own the PP, so we're going to deplete it. We have to think about subsequent expenditure, what happens when we spend money on the item after we've bought it, we might also choose to revalue the item. Finally, the last stage of its life is that we will get rid of it, we will dispose of it. So we're just going to take each of those stages in turn. So, to recognition to start off with. To record an item of PPE, we're going to debit PPE, we're going to record an asset in our balance sheet. It's a non-current asset because we're going to be using it for more than one accounting period. And get bank because I'm assuming here that we would be paying for the item. Now, you can see uh, the initial recognition according to IS 16 must be at cost. And the cost here is defined as being the cost in bringing the asset into working condition for its intended use. So cost that you incur in bringing the item into working condition for its intended use. So IS 16 gives us some guidance on items that we would be able to include here. So the basic purchase cost of the item, again, we can include any import duties that we might be paying if we bought it from overseas. Uh, so delivery costs as well would be an equivalent. Site preparation costs. Uh, potentially, if you bought a piece of land and then you want to build on it, so you've got to clear the original land before you can do that new building, you would be able to include those costs of clearing the land. Uh, modification costs, if required for intended use. So sometimes you buy the basic machine off the shelf, as it were, but then you might have it modified slightly so that it's going to work for your particular business and for what you want to use the machine for. The modification costs you can treat as part of the original cost of the asset. Um, installation costs, so then as I install, have the machine installed, I will be able to use it and then I can uh, include those installation costs. I can also include testing costs. Um, and professional fees. Professional fees might be most relevant, for example, we're buying um, building property, and therefore we have got to pay a solicitor to do all of the paperwork associated with the purchase of that building. So professional fees under IS-16, we are allowed to include. Okay. 
if some of you there are studying at the higher levels, you may also come across a situation of, of um, dismantling costs. So I'm thinking maybe something like an oil rig, uh, and at the end of the life of the oil rig, you're going to dismantle the item. You should also include those dismantling costs at initial recognition as well. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, um, one thing that would be excluded from the initial recognition figure for PPE would be training costs. So that is specifically mentioned in the accounting standard as something that should be excluded. So in, in exams, it's uh, sometimes something examiners might pick up on to try and catch you out because there's very clear guidance in the accounting standard that we should not include staff training costs. So recognition at cost. Costs incurred in bringing the item into working condition for its intended use. So once we've the item, during life, the one thing that we will generally always do is depreciate the item. So depreciation. Journal entry for depreciation, as you can see here, uh, we are going to be reducing the value of the asset in the balance sheet, so crediting uh, P uh, in the uh, SFP, and then charging that depreciation as an expense within the statement of profit or loss. Okay. Uh, the whole idea behind depreciation is we are reflecting that we are using up the asset, that we're using up the benefits that are available from the asset. Uh, and it's also an application of the matching concept. By putting an expense through your profit, you are matching that expense against benefits that you are getting from using the asset, which is normally in the form of revenue. And the credit, the reduction in the value of the asset in the SFP is reflecting that we are using the asset up, that we're wearing it out through use. Common misconception with depletion is that it's to do with reflecting the market value of the item. Um, so whilst we can say that with something like cars, that yes, the market value does go down over time, and therefore depreciation is set to reflecting that market value, if we thought about something like a property, that argument would not apply. Property tends to increase in value over time, and yet we still have to charge depreciation. So depreciation is not about trying to reflect market value. It is simply about the fact that we are reflecting using the asset. We are reflecting the use of the asset. Depreciation is calculated allocating the cost of the item less its residual value over useful life. So as you can see there, useful life is the period of time that we have the asset available for use. Now, just to appreciate at this stage, it is the period that the asset is available for us to use it. That's not necessarily the same as the actual life of the asset. So for example, when I buy a car, that car might physically last for 15 years. However, if I believe that I will only be using it for a period of 10 years, if I decide that I'm going to get rid of it and replace it with something else, then for my business, I would be saying the useful life is 10 years. Okay. Uh, residual value is then an estimate of the value of the asset at the end of its useful life. So sticking with the same example, I buy a car, even though I think it will last for 15 years physically, I intend on selling it after 10 years, then useful life will be 10 years and residual value would be what I think I will be able to sell the car for at the end of those 10 years. The only item that isn't negotiated is land. Okay, the only uh, example of PP that is not depreciated is land, and that is because land is deemed to have an infinite life. Okay, it will be there forever, um, and you cannot divide by infinity. So we do not depreciate land, but everything 
now is subject to depreciation. We have two methods of depreciation, straight line depreciation and reducing balance depreciation. A straight line depreciation, it is sometimes expressed as a percentage, in which case you are just applying that percentage to the cost figure. Uh, straight line is just taking the cost less the residual value and simply dividing then by the useful life so that you get the same amount of depreciation every single year. So straight line depreciation, the same amount of depreciation every year. Uh, reducing balance is simply, uh, as the name would suggest, then a reducing amount of depreciation every year, so higher when the asset is new and getting smaller as the asset gets older. We're doing reducing balance calculations then they will give you a percentage and you apply that to the carrying value of the item. Carrying value is the cost less depreciation. Okay? So that is depreciation whilst we own the item. Now, money that we might spend whilst we own the asset, so subsequent expenditure. Subsequent expenditure it's either going to be capitalized, i.e. treated as part of the cost of the asset, we're either going to be debiting PPE and crediting bank, um, or it is simply going to be expensed to profit, we're going to debit expense and credit bank. So the amount of the accounting standard are that uh, when the expenditure will increase the future economic benefits available from the item, then you can capitalize those costs. However, if the expenditure will not increase the benefits available from the asset, we cannot capitalize those costs. So, a um, couple of classic examples. If I have a building, um, I'm standing in a classroom now, uh, and my view at the back of the classroom is a kind of mustard yellow wall, which I have to say is not perhaps my favorite color. So if I decided that I was going to redecorate this classroom, then I'm actually increasing the benefits that I can get out of the classroom. I might see it as an improvement in terms of the English layman sense of the word to not have a mustard yellow wall and to have a, a more neutral colored wall, but I'm not improving, I'm not increasing the actual economic benefits that I can get out of the classroom. So simply repainting the wall, I will not be able to capitalize that expenditure. If, however, I decided to knock that wall down, take my hammer to it, knock the wall down, and then extend the classroom, and therefore double the capacity of the classroom, then I would be able to capitalize those costs. Because if I can fit more students in here, then I can generate more fees. I'm generating more future economic benefits. Okay, so in the economic benefit, I can capitalize simply maintaining those economic benefits. No, so anything uh, repairs, um, replacing, redecorating, it's all because of revenue expenditure, uh, and all of that must be expensed to profits. Um, they today servicing costs. You are just maintaining the condition of the assets, you're not actually improving anything. Okay. Now, the thing that might happen while we own the asset, apart from depreciation and apart from subsequent expense, the third thing that might happen would be to adopt a policy of revaluation. So, IS 16 gives us a little bit of choice here. Okay. We can continue with a cost model, uh, which would mean that we would be recording assets at cost less depreciation in the balance sheet, or we may adopt a revaluation model. Under revaluation model, the asset would be recorded at fair value less accumulated depreciation in the SFP. The value of the item is essentially just the market value of the item. Businesses would probably choose to revalue items like property, like land. We do not choose to revalue items like um, motor vehicles or machinery. Okay? So, 
Um, the, the difference being that with property and land, they are items that you tend to keep for quite a long period of time, and therefore the, the um, historic cost could be quite old, it could be quite out of date, and therefore irrelevant to the users of the financial statements. And the market value of the item is a much more up-to-date and relevant piece of information. Um, and also because, as I mentioned earlier, for items such as property, then market values do tend to increase over time, uh, and therefore the um, directors want to show the increases in the asset values in the books. They want to show those gains in value. So probably going to revalue things like property, land, but not worry about revaluing things like uh, motor vehicles. Okay, it's a choice. Uh, the only consequence of, well, two consequences of choosing to revalue an item is that once you start to revalue it, you do have to keep those revaluations up to date. So um, guidance is about every five years or so, just make sure that the valuations really do reflect the current market value. The other consequence of revaluing is that if I decide to revalue one item, I must revalue all items in the same category. So if I use to revalue one property, I must revalue all of my properties. But just because I'm revaluing property does not mean to say that I need to revalue motor vehicles of uh, recording and dealing with revaluations in terms of double entries for the process is to ensure that we calculate the revaluation gain or loss and that's simply done by comparing the fair value, the market value that we're trying to revalue it to, against the carrying value that I currently have sitting in my balance sheet. Where the fair value is higher, then I have a valuation gain and where their value is lower than the existing carrying value, I have a revaluation loss. And so the earlier that we are in our studies, we would probably only be dealing with revaluation gains and not losses. So to record revaluation gain, you will be increasing the actual asset, so debiting the item of PPE in the balance sheet. Then on the credit side, a revaluation gain it's considered to be an unrealized gain. I don't actually have my hands on that cash. If you are lucky enough to own your own house, if you just think to yourself what you paid for it and what the house might be worth now, then yes, okay, there is a gain in the value of the property there, but you don't have that in hard physical cash sitting in your bank account. So it's what we refer to as an unrealized gain. Consequently, we're allowed to show that gain in profit. Instead, we show it in a section called other comprehensive income. So the OCI on my slide there says stands for other comprehensive income, which is simply shown after profit in a statement of profit or loss. So you have revenue down to profit, statement of profit or loss, and then the OCI section, the other comprehensive of income section. So we just show the revaluation gain in there rather than in profit. From OCI section, it is taken to reserves in equity uh, in exactly the same way um, that uh, profit gets taken into returning reserve. But for items of OCI, they go into their own little reserve. So revaluation gain goes to a revaluation reserve. Okay. So debit the asset and then create the gain into a OCI and from there put it into a revaluation reserve in the balance sheet. Valuation losses. Valuation losses. Um, you'll be crediting the asset. The asset is declining in value, so we're going to be crediting PPE. On the bit side, first of all, you would consider whether this item that you've lost in value, whether it was previously revalued upwards. Okay? So you might have a situation whereby um, I have a revaluation loss of, let's say, 12. In the past, I had revalued the item upwards 7. In the past, I had put 7 into the valuation reserve. So when it goes down by 12, 
then I will be debiting OCI and the revaluation reserve, firstly with seven to reverse that previous gain. And then if I have any remaining loss, i.e. the remaining five, I then debit that into profit. Okay. So first of all, reverse any previous revaluation gains that are sitting in reserves and then put any remainder into profit. Okay. Evaluation. So, nearly there with the end of PP. I told you uh, IS 16 is a bit of a chunkier standard. The final step to do with IS 16 and PP is to then dispose of the item to get rid of it. So, when we dispose of the item, we're going to work out whether there is any gain or loss on disposal to be recognizing. So, we simply compare the proceeds that we get from selling the item. And we compare that against the carrying value of the item amount that it's sitting in the SFP at. Okay. Um, if we are scrapping the item rather than physically selling for cash, if you're scrapping it, then your proceeds are just simply zero. Okay. So it's the same principle. It's just that your proceeds figure would be zero. In terms of processing that transaction in a journal entry, going to the bank with any proceeds that I receive, any cash that I receive. Credit PP to remove the item from the balance sheet. And the balance, the debit or credit, will then be your gain or loss on disposal. So when you have a debit entry left over, that is a loss on disposal. And that will be taken to expenses. Uh, so we'll increase the expenses in your statement of profit or loss. If there is a credit entry, that's when you have a gain on disposal, and that will be a reduction in expenses. You still put it through expenses, but just treat it as a negative expense. Okay. Now, slight complication is if we're disposing of something that we have previously revalued. If I've previously revalued something, then I have have a revaluation reserve still sitting around in the balance sheet. So if I've got rid of the item, not only does the item get removed from the SFP, but the revaluation reserve must also get get removed from the SFP. All that happened in this situation is that you see transfer whatever else is sitting on that revaluation reserve to your retained earnings reserve. Okay, so just simply a reserve transfer, show it in a statement of changes in equity, a reduction in revaluation reserve, and an increase in retained earnings reserve. Okay. We're essentially just saying now that because I have sold the item and I've turned the item into cash, I've now realized that revaluation gain. I've now got my hands on that uh, in value in the form of cash, so I can treat it as realized I can treat it as profit, and I can put it into retained earnings. That is PPE. Give you uh, an opportunity to ask any questions, and also for me to just have a quick sip of my water. Okay, so we've about tangible non-current assets there with IS 16 and PP. So let's have a mention of intangible assets. So the accounting standard for intangible assets is IAS 38. Okay, IAS 38 intangible assets. Definition of intangible assets here. In order to be an intangible asset you must be identifiable, which uh, really just means that the item can be separated from the business as a whole. It can be uh, sold on its own without having to sell the whole business. 
The only way for, for an intangible item to be identifiable is if it's arising from a contractual right. So, for example, with a license, you have a license to operate something. A license is essentially a contract that gives you the right to operate. So, um, identifiable. On monetary, well, it's really just referring to the fact that investments, uh, investments, you can't physically touch them, and therefore we think of them intangible as well. They would not fall under the rules of this accounting standard. So Non-monetary is saying not invest. Okay, not investments. And then tangible is just catered for in the phrase without physical substance. So an intangible asset, you cannot physically touch it. So we're talking licenses, copy, patents, and things like that. Okay. Now, because of the fact that we cannot touch these items, uh, most of the issue with them comes from should we recognize them as an asset in the first place, can we treat them as an asset on the balance sheet. So in IS 38, we have some recognition criteria. We are allowed to capitalize the item if it is probable that it would generate future economic benefits to the entity. Uh, and also, you must be able to reliably measure the, the cost. Consequence of that these criteria are are that if we're purchasing something, I just simply go out and I buy the license or I buy a copyright, then those criteria are generally met and you can just simply capitalize the item at its cost. How? Where it is more of an internally generated item, uh, then the costs are very difficult to measure um, and it is often not so guaranteed that you will get some future economic benefit from it and therefore internally generated, we often cannot capitalize. Assuming that we will be capitalizing the item, it will be subject to amortization. Um, amortization is simply the equivalent of depreciation for intangible items. So we depreciate PPE, but we amortize intangible items. Uh, amortization tends to also be done on a straight line basis. Again, the principle remains the same over the useful life of the asset. IS38 also covers research and development. So, search, first of all, research is all about simply gaining new knowledge. Okay? So, uh, gauge on its own doesn't actually give us any benefit at all. Okay? Simply having knowledge doesn't give us any future benefit. And because we don't have the future benefit, then I cannot capitalize research costs. Because there will be nothing to then amortize those research costs and, and match them against in the future. So research we cannot capitalize because there's no future benefit. And therefore, the rule with research expenditure is that it must be simply expensed to profit. The only way that we get any benefit from knowledge is by using that knowledge to do something. Development cost uh, is then application of our knowledge to design either a new or an improved product. So uh, from selling that new or improved product, we wouldn't be able to generate future benefits. So with development, we can think about capitalizing out of IS38, you must capitalize development costs. You must capitalize development costs if certain criteria are met. You can say that I'm using a mnemonic pirate. Uh, I also have been taught sector. That's another fairly common uh, mnemonic to help you remember the criteria. So if the pirate or sector criteria are met, essentially all that those criteria are trying to demonstrate is that the development project is going to be successful. It is going to generate future benefits. So in more detail, the criteria, as you can see there, probable future benefits from the project. We intend to complete the project so that I will get hold of those future benefits. I have the resources available to complete it, so that would be both your technical and your financial resources. Um, 
you are able to use or sell the item and therefore to get future benefit from it. It's technically possible to develop whatever it is that you're trying to develop and the expenditure must be identifiable so that we can know exactly how much to capitalize. So when we meet all of those criteria, then we would capitalize our development costs and then in the future, as we start to get the benefits from them, they will then be amortized. Uh, just notice, however, the amortization that will only start once commercial production of the item starts. So once you actually start to get the benefits coming through. Okay. So that is IAS 38, intangibles and also covering research and development. Assets, I'm going to briefly take you through a little bit of IAS 36 impairment. I mentioned earlier, as accountants, we like assets being overstated. And since we are prudent, cautious, grey, boring, a bit like the weather today, really, um, and we don't like our assets being overstated too much. So we have an accounting standard impairment of assets that applies that principle quite generally, okay? Um, thing just to appreciate with IAS 36, when students first see this accounting standard, they're normally seeing it fairly soon after having done IAS 16 on PPE. So they often therefore think that IAS 36 only applies to PPE. IAS 36 is actually about a asset at all. Okay, so it might be talking about PP, uh, we might be talking infantry, we could be talking receivables, we could be talking about um, intangible assets, okay, any asset at all. So, rule 36, an asset is impaired, carrying value exceeds its recoverable amount. So, carrying value exceeds something, the carrying value is too high, the carrying value is overstated. The recoverable amount is then defined as being the higher of fair value less cost to sell and value in use. So fair value less cost to sell, essentially market price minus cost to sell. So what you would recover from selling the item, what you would recover from selling the item. Values, on the other hand, is what we are going to get from using the item. So, uh, for a set like a machine, I'll talk about PP just because it's a nice, simple example for us to understand. Um, so, if we take something like a machine, um, then we use it to make widgets. We sell those widgets and therefore get future cash flows. So we take those future cash flows. They could be going a long time into the future because the machine might last for several years. Therefore, they would have to get discounted back to a present value. So value in use is then the value that I'm getting from using the item. So hopefully, it would be fairly logical that we do whatever would achieve the most. So if I can get more from the item, I would choose to do that. If I can get more from using it, then that's what I would choose to do. So the recoverable amount, therefore, becomes the higher of those two figures. Okay? So that recoverable amount represents what the item is worth to that particular business. Therefore, if its carry value is higher than that amount, we're saying the carrying value is too high in the balance sheet and therefore we must write it down accordingly okay to record the impairment loss to write it down you're just writing it down from the carrying value down to the recoverable amount uh, to record that impairment loss you're going to be reducing the asset so you create the asset in the SFP and on the whole you simply charge that impairment loss as an expense to your profit there is a bit of an exception to the rule there. Um, if we are talking about an impairment on an item of PPE that you've previously revalued, 
then you would have to charge the impairment loss against the revaluation reserve first and then against profits. But that's the exception to the rule. Main principle, debt expense and credit the asset. And as I said, the whole thing behind I-36 is simply to make sure that our assets are not overstated. Moving swiftly on our whistle stop tour, I-17 and leases. So, leases, um, a lot of businesses have a lot of leases. Uh, when businesses either don't have the cash to be able to buy items outright, or maybe they, they would just rather not buy the item outright um, because they'll save the cash to use it for something else, then may well enter into a lease agreement uh, to access the item in instead. So, I-17 applies in this situation. Now, um, under I-17, leases are classified as either finance leases or operating leases. So finance leases are defined as being a lease where the risks and rewards of ownership transfer to the lessee. So lessee is the, is the person that is using the asset, the person that is uh, paying the rentals to be able to use the item. And we're saying under a finance lease, they have the risks and rewards of ownership. So even though legally they do not own the item, they have the risks and rewards. And for, from an accounting point of view, we're going to be saying that the substance of the situation is that, in effect, that asset is their asset. However, the definition of an operating lease, the official definition of an operating lease, is all other leases. Um, not the most helpful definition in the world, I have to say. Um, but nevertheless, it is the formal definition now to the accounting standard. Any lease that isn't a finance lease is an operating lease. What that actually means is, of course, that the risks and the rewards of ownership remain with the lessor rather than the lessee. So things that they might tell you about in scenarios to get you thinking about the risks and rewards of ownership. Um, whether there is transfer of legal ownership at the end of the agreement to the lessee, that would indicate that uh, it is a finance lease. If they ultimately become the legal owner, the chances are that they were the substance owner as well, i.e. they had the risks and rewards. The length of the lease uh, is, is a good m indicator of what type of lease it is. The longer the lease, uh, in relation to the life of the asset, the closer it is to a finance lease. Okay, so the longer the lease compared to the life of the asset, we would consider it to be a finance lease. Uh, so have a look at the present value of minimum lease payments. So look at the minimum amount that you have to pay under the terms of the agreement. Discount those payments back to a present value. If it is essentially the, the um, price that you would have to pay for the item anyway, then we're saying that the substance of the lease situation is that you have effectively just bought the item. Who's responsible for repairs and insurance? Well, repairs and insurance, that's the risk of ownership. The lease cancelable. If we can't cancel the lease, then again, we are taking on a risk so would indicate that the has a risk of ownership that it's a finance lease where it's a non-cancellable lease. So those are often things that you might uh, be given within a scenario and then have to discuss if you're being asked to conclude what type of lease you're looking at. From the account point of view, let's go finance leases first of all. So as I said, the substance of a situation with a finance lease that the lessee is acquiring the asset and is just simply financing it via a loan. So we have uh, the first double entry here is that you recognize the asset, you treat it as an item of PPE, you are showing the loan equivalent, the finance lease obligation on the credit side of the entry. Because treating it as an item of PPE, it will be subject to depreciation, so just a normal depreciation double entry there. You would depreciate it over the length of the lease, so uh, however long you have the item for, so the length of the lease. Then the finance 
defence lease uh, obligation. Um, lease obligation is in effect just a loan, and therefore you have got to record the interest on that loan. So finance cost, and you increase the liability. And then the final double entry to think about with finance leases is the fact that there will be the lease instalment that you pay every year probably. So that will reduce your liability and is a credit out of your bank account. These are the entries that you would work your way through with a finance lease. Operating leases, uh, a little bit easier and a little bit quicker. Um, in substance, for operating lease, the substance is the same as the legality. So the situation the lessee is simply hiring the item and paying a rental in return. So we have a rental expense. Um, that rental expense is going to get charged to fit. Um, the little rule in IS17 does say that you charge it on a straight line basis. So just simply take the total lease payment divided by the length of the lease and that will give you your annual expense. You debit that expense to profit, it bank with whatever you're physically paying. Um, what that does mean is that if we are um, not paying the, the lease payment straight line, if we're not paying the same amount every single year, there might be a balancing prepayment or accrual to put in SFP at the reporting date. And that leases. Oh, I think I've got a few minutes left. A few minutes left. A bit on revenue. Should we do a little bit on revenue just very quickly? So, it is defined as being the gross inflow of economic benefits from your ordinary activities. Uh, so, gross is just referring to the idea of gross of the... Um, including a profit that you're going to make. So uh, not just the profit, not just the overall inflow, but the actual selling price, okay, the selling price. Gross inflow of economic benefits from ordinary activities, your day-to-day -day activities. So debit bank, debit receivable, uh, depending on whether it's a cash or credit sale, obviously, and credit revenue, show the income in your statement of profit or loss. Measurement-wise, revenue must be measured at the fair value of any concession that has been received or receivable. So when we're talking about a cash sale, uh, and I've received cash, and the fair value is just simply the amount of cash that I've received, when we're talking a credit sale, then the cash is receivable in the future. For most credit sales, that's relatively short term, 30 days, 60 days. Uh, there are occasions, however, where it might be a longer time in the future, and therefore you should discount to a present value uh, because uh, the time value of money would be material in that situation. We then have certain recognition criteria within IAS 18, and that determines when we recognize the revenue, when we recognize the revenue. So, recognition criteria. First of all, a couple of general criteria. Uh, two things, we must be able to reliably measure the revenue, and we must also be able to reliably measure the associated costs. That's because we want to match revenue and cost of sales against each other in our statement of profit or loss. So we need to be able to reliably measure both of those items. Also, it must be probable that the economic benefit benefits will flow to the entity. It must be probable that we will uh, get the benefit from the sale ultimately to be able to record it in the first place. Then IS18 has some more specific criteria depending on whether your revenue is from selling goods or whether it's from selling services. So from the sale of goods first of all, uh, you can recognize revenue from the sale of goods when you transfer the risks and rewards of ownership. So when the customer is taking on the risks and rewards, uh, and when the customer takes over control of those goods, we are therefore saying that those goods are no longer our assets, 
and therefore we should de-recognise the asset, we should treat it as having been sold, we should recognise the revenue. Revenue sale of services is by reference to a stage of completion. So as you, you complete and provide that service, you may recognise revenue from providing that service. Okay, so I think we have just got one more accounting standard. I've probably got about a minute or so, so let's just try and uh, get through that one quickly. We were a couple of minutes delayed, so starting because of my the shared desktop issue. Um, so let's just get to IS 37, and then we will have covered everything. IS 37, of IS 37, uh, provisions is, is what IS 37 is all about, ability of uncertain timing or amount. So potential liabilities is what we're interested in with IS 37. The classic example that you start to see um, is where a company is perhaps being sued for breach of copyright uh, or somebody is suing it because they injured themselves um, and potentially therefore the company is facing a liability of paying out a compensation claim. That's the kind of classic early example we see in terms of provision. Uh, IS 37 provides us with some, oh sorry, double entry first. So I credit the provision, show a liability in your balance sheet um, and charge the associated loss to profit. Again, that's the, the double entry most of the time. Occasionally, you actually debit an asset. You might remember that I mentioned dismantling costs if you're judging at a high level earlier. In that situation, you're debiting PPE, crediting provision. But for straightforward provisions, debit expense and credit provision. Uh, IS 37 then gives us some recognition criteria. So we must meet three criteria before we can recognize a provision. First of all, there must be a present obligation so more likely than not, um, as a result of a past event. There must be this past trigger event that's creating the obligation. So in other words, we are not allowed to anticipate things happening in the future and provide for them because there's too much risk of manipulation in that scenario. Probable that an out of economic benefit will be required in order to settle the obligation, so it's got to be more likely than not probable that we will be paying out money and as always if we're going to start putting it in the books we must be able to reliably measure it so to be able to record a provision we must meet all three criteria if we don't meet the criteria that's then have a contingent liability a contingent liability is where you have a possible obligation rather than a probable obligation rather than a probable outflow of economic benefits. So when it's only possible that you might lose the court case and have to pay the compensation, we shouldn't actually put liability in the balance sheet. In that scenario, we would simply disclose it by note. Okay? So we make our users aware of it, uh, warn them about the potential liability, but we wouldn't actually show it as a liability in the balance sheet. As always, there's an exception to that rule as well. Uh, if we think the probability of having to pay anything out is remote, we wouldn't even put it in the note of the accounts. We would simply ignore it altogether. I7 also covers contingent assets, really just being on the opposite side of the same coin. So rather than being the company that is being sued, perhaps you're a company doing the suing, and therefore you're potentially going to be on the receiving end of that uh, compensation, um, and therefore you have a possible asset as a result of a past event. So with possible assets, uncertain assets, if it is probable that we will get the item, then we are allowed to disclose it by note. But anything less than that, we should ignore it. Okay, It gets no mention at all. And that concludes our whistle stop tour of the accounting standards. So, thank you very much for uh, signing up to the masterclass today and for listening this afternoon. I do hope I've managed to shed some light on the requirements of some of our key accounting standards for you. 
Um, so we will be sending out uh, a link over the next few days for which will contain a recording of this presentation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That link will also contain a copy of the slides that I, I have used so that you will be able to review all of the information. So thank you very much. And all that it remains for me to say is that I wish you the very best of luck in your exams. Enjoy your afternoon. Bye.